Thank you, Boris. Thank you, Boris. Um, yeah, I have, I have now the chance to be a research uh, scientist at UBC in the Changing Ocean uh, Research Unit, uh, led by William Cheng. Um, I thank you for having me. And, uh, so I'm going to present today on my last five years work on understanding the pattern of mine biodiversity. Uh, basically trying to understand the current pattern in order to predict the future pattern in the context of climate change. But let's start with the beginning. The beginning is why biodiversity? Why not another metric? And what is the role of biodiversity? Um, as you can see, I, and I work on this a new figure, uh, biodiversity is contributing to all the elements that we know about the ocean and as an influence on the environment sustainability with uh, complex habitat by cleaning the water or acting as a biological pump, as well as resource availability that are drive, driving our fisheries and our economy. Um, also, biodiversity is a key factor in regulating ecosystem. Uh, basically, biodiversity is the structure that define the phenology, the trophodynamic, the, therefore the biomass of an ecosystem and give you the, the, this multiplicity of traits. And I really like this little comics that I found uh, a week ago where you see a man saying, why care if species go extinct, but why care is basically, it's a pyramid behind you that sustain all our resources, agriculture or uh, fisheries. And therefore, if you remove one of these species, the, the whole card castle is gonna collapse. But let's go with, with the basic. And the basic is what are the various forms of life on earth? And I'm pretty sure since undergrad, we are even before we've seen this tree with bacteria, archaea and eukaryotes, and we are part of the eukaryotes. And if we are zooming in the ocean, we can see that there is plenty of life of form from Animalia with fungi, protozoa, plantae, or comista. Plantae and comista being, um, being a photosynthetic organism, fungi, as you know, are fungi, and Animalia giving you all the things that we, are, that we know in, uh, in the ocean. According to recent estimation, um, so, so that would be the work of Camilo Moura in 2008, who used basically the taxonomy known at that time of all the listed referenced species in the ocean. One third of the species are marine. And re recently, with the, there was a work trying to um, evaluate uh, the biomass of life on Earth. And here is one of their main uh, res uh, result, and you can see I put it in blue, all the, the part of species that are marine, and the majority of biomass by far is marine. But as we all know now, all the natural systems are now impacted by uh, human activities, human activities in a large sense, from fisheries, pollution, and of course, in an indirect way, with climate change. Uh, in the high-level panel uh, for sustainable ocean economy, we analyze how first um, how much biodiversity was impacted by all these um, anthropo uh, anthropogenic um, pressures using the Alperin et al. index, and what you can see in the, um, in this um, in this uh, result is that you have kind of a linear relationship. And sadly, uh, the marine hotspot of the world are where there is the most impact from the humans. And only 19, 20% of the ocean is con considered for now low impact. More importantly, uh, and that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of sarcastic, all the part of biodiversity, all the trees of biodiversity is, at, is impacted by human impact in various ways. So he, all, all the, um, the low traffic level will be impacted by pollution and change in the nutrient cycle. All the higher impact will be impacted by fisheries, by light, uh, light and sound pollution, by habitat change or destruction of habitat. So 
And of course, all marine traffic web are impacted by climate change, uh, which is the work of the fish MIP uh, group. So that give us a sad reality. And, but we, we still have a chance. We still have a chance of conservation. And this is now, it's really now and we need to grab that chance. It is now the decade for the ocean, um, for the ocean and for sustainable development. We have currently around 11 to 12, depending on how you measure conservation, but we have from 11 to 12% of the ocean is partially or fully conserved using NPA. And we need to, provide new conservation tools, new areas to protect, but we need to do it rigor rigorously. In order to do, do that, in this presentation, I'm going to present you three parts of my work. The first part is the practical challenge. Um, how can we get species distribution? How can we can we study and how can we study the full spectrum of biodiversity? And if we succeed to do that, what are the patterns? What are the emerging patterns that we are seeing? Let's start at the beginning. And this is the part that honestly, I personally underestimate uh, when I started to work on biodiversity. In order to work on biodiversity, and I know it sounds tautological, but you need a taxonomic list. And luckily, because I went uh, to Yale for, to work for a postdoc, so I work with the terrestrial people, they don't have a website or a group such as the World Register of Marine Species. This group is sitting every week and try at least to provide a full accepted taxonomy according to recent publications. So we, we as the ocean people, when I was there, that was my nickname, the ocean, the ocean guy, because I was the only guy working on the ocean there. Um, we were considered to be extremely lucky. But when you go into those uh, taxonomic lists and those taxonomic accepted lists, you can see that there is only 200,000 species that are registered, that are listed. And if you compare to the previous number that I gave you from Camilo Mora, that represents only 10% of potential species that could be in the ocean. So that started, that is a starting point. When we are working on biodiversity and in the data or in the groups that I'm going to talk, that represents only 10%. Then when you start to go and you start to have an accepted list, you start to understand um, how many species there is per taxa and per group, you start to discover uh, another reality. Is that only few groups, and usually the groups with the less amount of species, got good data coverage. And in this case, it's usually the emblematic or the exploited group. So we can we can split this in three groups. The good, the good ones would be the iconic, such as the turtles, fish, or mammals, which here will have 80% of their species having um, information, spatial information on the species. Then the vast majority of the species will be in the bad from 20% of the species to 19% of the species. So that would be jellyfish, corals, um, asteroids, egg, um, crabs, octopus, all the mollusk, uh, the plankton. Let's not start with the plankton because we don't even know. Uh, we, are we, st we are still in the process of describing part of the main part of plankton. Uh, and then the ugly, which are um, phytoplankton and worms which is, when you think about it, pretty funny since the, the website is called Worms. Then you discover a second thing that is really highly frustrating and that I fully underestimate when I started this, this work, is that this classification, especially since the arrival of easy DNA sequencing, is constantly changing. There is an update on the taxonomy of Worms at a monthly basis, and you can see full parts of this species changing clusters. So when you're trying to model, trying to analyze a taxa or a group of taxa, this, you can lose 1,000, 2,000 to 3,000 species within a month. So you need to be flexible and you need to be up to date in your work. More importantly, 
uh, you need to accept that there is a lot of synonyms for one species. Some species got until 30 names, 30 Latin names, because there has been, as you can imagine, there has been discovered in many places and each other first thought that they were the first. And when you collect the data, now that we are in, the, in an open world with internet, you assemble all these synonyms and you need to find a way to see that they are the same species. So for, for a long time, when you were merging the data, there was there was a lot of spe rare species, local endemic species that were considered two species and recently we were discovered to be just one. Then let's go to step two, if you want to work on biodiversity. What type of data do we have? The main one that we are using are occurrence data. And there is a wide variety of them. A wide variety of up, um, open database that you can find on the web, uh, such as Obis, GBF, Copypod for plankton, GDive for jellyfish, uh, Pangea for honestly everything. Um, and they come from various sources, survey, museum collection, catch allocation, GPS tracking, eDNA, or just sighting when it comes to mammals. But as you can imagine, since they, they cover the wide variety of species and, and they are coming from a wide, a wide variety of uh, data type, there is a bias of distribution for most of species. When I say most of species, it's when I'm talking about the ugly group of database of, of species with not a lot of that of data. Usually the spatial distribution is incomplete and, and there is misidentification and false reporting like for the catch. Uh, here you got uh, on on the top on the top left over there uh, the distribution according to obi, uh, obvious of the bluefin tuna and as you can see you can see there is point of bluefin tuna next to Vancouver Island or in the, in the California current, where we know that tinus tinus is just a North Atlantic bluefin tuna and should not be out of the North Atlantic. And that could be just misidentification from museum collection, got some samples and just mislabeled their GPS location. Or uh, in more rare case, uh, synonyms that were misidentified or misgrouped with another name, with another accepted name, creating false location around the world. But also false reports. So when you're using also fish allocation, sometimes the, the reporting of a species will be done, will be not, not done where it has been sampled, but in the port where it was brought by the fishermen. And sometimes you discover, like in the case of shark, that species that were in Brazil, for instance, uh, along the coast of Brazil, were reporting, reporting in Panama in the Pacific coast of Panama. Therefore, when you're looking at the distribution, you have a weird distribution of the species and you need to take care of that. And in order to take care of that, you need to apply filters. So either you're doing filtering using biogeographical method, like, I don't know, you're using um, important main classification of, of ecosystems such as um, marine ecoregion of the world, uh, the biochemical division of Longhurst, or uh, you can use range map and statistical tools such as the work of uh, Derek Sitinsor in 2010 which was using different type of point around the ocean for, if I do remember, 10,000 species of fish and some other groups. And by apl applying Kind of uh, spatial statistical method, it could have an idea of the range of these species. But it, you, you need to remember that we are as good as the data that we have. And extrapolation using statistics, even using fancy statistic methods, um, we need to accept that it's not perfect. And we might overestimate or underestimate the distribution of, of a lot of species. The second type of data that we have are the expert range map. They are way more reliable because they are kind of uh, polygon data made by experts uh, and validated by experts uh, using independent set of, ver of uh, validation uh, tools. The only problem with that, that is that this kind of, um, of uh, expert range map are for only a few species. 
if you look at the full spectrum of biodiversity, it's really a few species. It's always the most exploited or the most iconic, such as shark, turtle, corals. But it's always a small sample for each taxa and always in the re in either in the good part of the, the group that I call bad or mainly in the good in the good ones, so such as fish, turtle, or mammals. Um, unfortunately, and it's really hard to understand the methodology that the experts are using. I'm pretty sure it, it can be found, but we it's it's hard to see if the methodology is the same for each species, because I can understand that it's hard to find an expert for all the species, especially when it become a rare and local and endemic species. And something that is frustrating when you're working on species distribution also is that there is conflict, conflict of expert range map, such as the difference between the FAO range map and the WCMC, UNEP WCMC uh, range map. So when you just take the information that I show you with your occurrence and put it in front of expert range map made on the other side, you have some surprising results. Um, here you got four, uh, four species of, of shark. And if you look at it, the main ones, the ones that are the most well-known, most of the occurrence, which is here, this histogram, are within the expert range map, which is great. It shows that the expert range map is incredible. but for species that are here, uh, for, for some species that are more rare, more endemic to a, species, to a certain location, you start to find occurrence that are in other basin. Such here, this species is known to be next, in, next to the coast of Brazil, and you have occurrence that are in Seychelles or in the, ch the channel of Mozambique. Well, I'm sure that the experts are right, sometimes 95% of the occurrence are out of the expert range map. So I expect, of course, that the expert range map is right, but sometimes maybe some region has not been evaluated yet. And the occurrence are showing that maybe the expert range map could be a bit more wide. And when you're working in, the, in this case, it was a work on, uh, on 57, 60 species of shark, you could see that 50% of the occurrence were in the expert range, which is great, but 42% of this, the same occurrence from the same database are out with some data that are located basically on the other side of the world. So we can ask this question. Um, does the, the database that, that we that we, where we are downloading data are that wrong, meaning that 50% of the data that we are downloading are misidentified or misreported? Or does the expert range map are for some species? Because I'm again and I, re, I really want to, to emphasize that for most of the species, it's incredible work, but for some species, it may be too restricted to some location. Okay, once you got that, you arrive to a third problem, the sampling bias. As you can imagine, most of the bias, uh, most of the sampling that we have are next to the coast and in the northern hemisphere. You need to add to that a sec, uh, an historical bias is that taxonomists are most most of them come from northern region. Therefore, Northern Hemisphere. Therefore, there is less taxonomies that are from the Southern Hemisphere. Therefore, less potential discovery of new species in the Southern Hemisphere. So you always need to keep in mind that there is more potential more species in the Northern Hemisphere just because of these two bias. Then there is a second thing that um, we, the ocean people, need to deal with while the terrestrial doesn't the third dimension. And we have this problem of data in the coast, but more importantly, we have this data problem in the deep. And exponentially, the more you're going to the deep, the more, the less you got data. And the more you're going towards the high seas, the less you got data. So I let you imagine the information that we have in the high seas and in the deep of the high seas, which by the way, represent the majority of our ocean. 
But when you start to filter all these uh, all these occurrence, trying to use the expert range map to to clean the data set, trying to use statistics to unbiased the sampling effect, this is the map that you have. This is uh, the map of the biodiversity of more than forty five thousand of species. Um, from from the whole spectrum of biodiversity and what you obviously noticing is that there is some hot spots which is in the coral triangle in indonesia in the indonesia filipino triangle in um in the mozambique channel in the caribbean sea and which i think it is a uh, sampling bias here next to florida and in the south next to florida roughly and in the North Sea, just, just due to an oversampling of these areas. And to summarize the pattern, we are use, usually using the famous Latinal diversity gradient. The Latinal diversity gradient is telling us that there is less species in the poles and more and more species towards the tropic. In the terrestrial realm, we, they have a perfect dome with a peak in the equator, technically next to the equator in the Somalian uh, spike, that you, in the, the Somalian horn. But when you combine all these data that we have done, you see a different shape. You see that it's a bimodal biodiversity. So there is a bimodal meaning that the, there is two peak one peak in the southern hemisphere and one peak in the northern hemisphere these two peaks are located around 20 22 degrees north and south and there is a deepening of biodiversity especially in the coastal realm so everything um under um under 200 meters of bathymetry around the equator and you can clearly see it here the case of the of uh, of the degree zero of latitude is really interesting. Is it has been emerging recently because uh, in the previous work of uh, Derek Tinsor and and Boris, uh, when you're using a wider um, grid, you don't see the deepening. And then some study came with with zoo plankton with the uh, Atlantic Meridian transect and showed with copepod that there was this deepening. So we don't know if this deepening is valid for all the taxonomic group. And we don't know what are the reasons. Is it just because there is a less percentage of coast at zero degrees latitude or because the, the environment is not as stable because there is more storm, more hurricane, we don't we don't know, but if you're going into the oceanic part of the ocean, so the ICs, you can see that there is no deepening. It's a perfect dome. So it's really interesting to see this emerging pattern, pattern. and maybe it's just a sampling bias. We just have less information around the equator. Okay, and of course, if you subdivide this. Uh, this Latin diversity gradient by big groups such as copepod, corals, fish, foraminifera, macroalgae, uh, invertebrate, mammal or phytoplankton, you start to see that there is different shape of, um, of, um, of Latin diversity gradient with sometimes wider and no deepening towards the, the equator, which is usually the mammals. The mammals got a, a really large dome. Um, are really asymmetric um, uh, and bimodal uh, the diversity gradient that you can clearly see uh, with the fish and with the um, phytoplankton and the zooplankton. And so what you see here is basically a Latino diversity gradient that is shaped by the traits and the, pref the ecological preference of the, of the taxa within a position of oceanic and coastal species and lower and higher trophic species. Okay, now that we have examined all these patterns, uh, let's try to understand them and how can we explain them? There is two ways to do it. Either you doing a holistic approach. Basically, I've got an awesome database with plenty of, the, of, uh, of observation and I'm gonna pull all this data, put a fancy 
statistical methodology, so linear method, artificial neural network, boosted regression tree, uh, generalized additive model, whatever, what, whatever is your preference. And you're using various variables, so environment, because obviously oceanic, uh, oceanic spe species are, um, uh, are ectoterms or kind of kiloterms. Um, and you see what are the results, what are the main variables, and then you, you use the result to have an idea of what are the processes that drove to your result. Either you got an inverse approach, which is a, pro a process-based approach, where you're going to use theory in order to mimic the observation that you have. So you got the historical theory, you basically saying that um, the continental shift, uh, the geological, in the geological times, con the continental shift had driven the shape that we are seeing now in biodiversity. Uh, mathematical just effect with the mid domain effect where Basically, in any dimension of fin uh, ended finite, you will always statistically have more of something in towards the middle than towards the bound. It's just mathematic. Or the IRI hypothesis, which was uh, proposed by Terborg in 1973, basically saying there is more tropic in the ocean or on land, for instance. Therefore, that's why there is more species. But this has been disc um, um, discarded both on land and in the, in, the, in, the, in the ocean. And there is other theories that has been uh, stated that you can find the, in the book of Derek and, uh, and, uh, and Boris. OK, let's start with the holistic approach. So we use data here, both on land and, uh, and in the marine, uh, that I, I presented to you uh, just just right before and we use uh, an, an artificial neural network to evaluate what are the main variable explaining biodiversity distribution in this case what we found was pretty known to be honest in the literature basically the first variable so that's the blue part that you're seeing just on my top here uh, it's bathymetry then water temperature by far by far and then after a sunlight, which is a correlate of temperature, obviously, and then oxygen. But there is a problem. What does bath bathymetry mean? Bathymetry is basically showing um, a kind of mixed variable, of a, a, a mixed group of variable. Species are not totally sensible to, to bathymetry itself. They are sensible to pressure, that's for sure. They are sensible to the light that they have, for sure. They are sensible to um, the amount of food that they have, so the primary production. Uh, and they are sensible of temperature. And as you know, the more the bathymetry is deep, the, 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 the lower is the temperature. So using depth as a main variable either just show the opposition between open ocean and coastal areas, either show that it's a group of variables that control everything. So you need to go to the next one, temperature, oxygen, prime production. What you see here is that water temperature is the main one, by far. But what is the process? How can you explain that temperature is, such, is playing such a major role? And in order to do that, you need to use a kind of approach that is in the middle between the holistic approach and the process-based approach. It's the, uh, the thermal niche, the ecological niche of Hutchinson. So if you compute the thermal niche of all the species, because we have the distribution of the species, we have for some of the, the, some of the, 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 the data points that we have, we know when and where they have been sampled. So we can find what was the temperature at the, the exact time. So you can have an idea of how wide the niche is, so that would be the breadth, and the average of the niche. And when you map that in a 2D representation, so where here in the y-axis, you got the breadth, so how wide is the niche, and in the abscess, you got the mean thermal niche, what you found is that there is three types of hot spots in, uh, in the ocean. Obviously, the major, and so here the color are uh, the species richness. Obviously, most of the species are located in the tropics, so in warm water, so here. 
between 25 and 30 degrees. And they, they present a niche that is really, really narrow, which could be just an evolutionary process of endemic species that are living in the tropics and therefore are adapted to a climate where with a low oscillation of temperature. And you can see that there is a spread of this of biodiversity. The more and more you're going to the lower temperature, the more and more the niche is wider, which is basically tautological with the idea of climate. The more and more you're, you're going high in latitude, the more and more you've got variability of, um, of climate. And so you got a second peak that you find between 10 and 15 degrees, which is the temperate area, with a wide niche of five to 10 degrees, meaning, meaning that this species could be in the tropic, but also could go towards the pole. And finally, you got the last little point of endemicity that you can find around zero degrees of temperature and with a really narrow niche, which is the polar endemic species, species that are totally adapted to a polar environment that, that is extremely cold. So what you can remember here is that in the poles, you're going to have a mix of endemic species extremely, extremely adapted, mixed with cosmopolitan species that have a super wide niche and can come seasonally when there is more prime production, for instance. The temperate area where you got obviously endemic species in temperate area, but most of them have a wide niche. So in using that representation, you don't see this endemicity, but you see that they can cope with a wide variety of, uh, of uh, temperature seasonality. Therefore, they can either migrate just or just being sessile like oyster, for example, that just since they are sessile, they need to cope with a wide variety of, uh, of temperature. And finally, the tropics with lower and narrower niche and uh, warm temperature. And this could be cause, um, and so this gradient of the more and more the water is warm, the more and more you find species could be caused by different um, explanation, either by the fact that warm temperature causes higher metabolism and higher mutation rate, therefore, and, gener and shorter generation time, which push uh, the speciation. So the more and more species you have. Also, you can have uh, an increase of, of demand for food at uh, for food at warmer temperature and increasing competition and pred predatory prey interaction. So basically, species would have two choices. The more and more species there is, the more and more you need food to stay, the more and more you need to be adapted to a super specific niche in order to stay. And so if you, your niche is narrow, you're exploiting just a tiny part. And so while in, a, in an area where there is less species, you can have a wider um, niche and so less species because otherwise there would be exclusion in the predatory prey uh, competition. Okay, once we have done that, we are going to the main theory that are currently accepted in order to explain uh, biodiversity. The first one, uh, that is the one that has been ruling since, a, since at least a good 20, 30 years, is the climate stability hypothesis. The idea behind that is for two reasons. One, the author were saying that basically the less the climate is fluctuating, the more and more, uh, the, sorry, the more the climate is fluctuating, that will increase the extinction rate uh, and therefore reducing mechanically the, um, the, the, um, the biodiversity that we are observing. Doesn't mean there is no speciation, it's just the speciation fail. And this could be validated using a prehistorical observation. Basically, when there was the little ice age, the, there was the shift in, the, in the, the climate stability. Climate stability was not at the same areas that it, it, it was that is observed now. And we can see using fossils that peak of diversity were there. At this exact same spot where there was less fluctuation in the in the environment, while now in, if we are working with the work with the data that we have since 200, 200, 150 years, to be honest, 
we can see that there is more um, biodiversity in the tropics where there is less fluctuation, more speciation. Therefore, this um, you can use an analysis and you can use the standard deviation of temperature, either surface or bottom, and compute a GLM in order to mimic species uh, richness uh, using seasonality and average. And you can mimic uh, the, the, this hypothesis and this is the result that you, that you can have. Basically, that's the result of doing the GLM using the various type of seasonal fluctuation and uh, trying to match by observed biodiversity. What you can see is basically what we expected. More species towards uh, the tropics and more species towards the IT, the intertropical um, region. It works. So if here you can see uh, the um, Latino diversity gradient in black, that would be, that would be the observation. The stability, uh, the climate stability theory would be in green. So you see, you can catch the dome of biodiversity. And so you catch the main pattern. And so all the species that add a smooth Latino diversity gradient. So the pelagic species, uh, pelagic uh, species, pelagic fish, uh, the corals, or the macroinvertebrate match perfectly with this theory. Nonetheless, the one that have a more bimodal uh, Latino diversity gradient are not explained perfectly with it. And this gave an idea to uh, Beaugrand in 2014, saying, you know what, let's try to have a more a theory that is between a process-based approach and um, and an holistic approach. Let's just model the thermal niche of random species, totally random. They they have no reason, they have no logic in the real world. We just model the thermal niche, both in the in the water column and in the in the seafloor. We let them run for 1,000 years, following the, the data that we have uh, using geological uh, models. And the only rules that we are imposing is that two species having the same niche cannot be in the same cell. Fair, because that, that would be the principle of um, exclusive competition. And what this theory is showing is that you start to find, again, this asymmetry in biodiversity, in the Latin diversity gradient, just using this simple analysis with one variable. And if you're doing the same analysis, but with the niche of the species that were, was observed, so the niche that I showed to you in the previous slide. Then you start to see that all, so that would be, up uh, oh, behind me, of course, all the groups are pretty well explained. Therefore, um, Beaugrand published in 2017 and 18, I think, the, uh, a theory called the chessboard of life or the methyl um, hypothesis, and this is how you can state it. That university gradient emerged from the interplay between the species niche in the census of the ecological niche of Hutchinson and the temporal fluctuation of temperature, which is, if, when you think about it, a kind of mid domain effect within the climate stability theory. Um, and that's all. So basically, temperature is the main driver because is the main driver in shaping the niche. And that brings us to the last part of this talk, the Anthropocene, the, the Anthropocene challenge. Can using simple variables such as temperature, oxygen, so the ones that we, we were using to try to, to explain biodiversity, can we model the distribution of species? And therefore, if you model the distribution of species, can we model the distribution of biodiversity and how climate change will impact as we know and i'm sure as undergrad grad or senior uh, professors especially in this lab you're pretty aware of climate change and we all know that the rate of climate change is never seen before and it is altering the natural limits of the known parameters that uh, we are we are measuring either in pH, either in oxygen, bottom or surface. Of course, the, the bottom being altered uh, less rapidly, but at the moment it's altered given the fact that 
you are more in the deep there is the system is not used to a lot of fluctuation so a little change in the deep is really important for the species and so we expect terrible consequence from and this is reserved for various authors um, this change of environment will of course redefine the, the distribution of the ecosystem that we know with the apparition in towards the, the tropic of potentially new type of biomes, new type of combination of parameters that we have not seen since geological times, or even not at all. And contrary to what we, we think, sooner than later, sooner than later, uh, you see the, the, these pockets are in white here and they are starting to emerge kind of um, an extreme event for the, for the models starting in 2030 and we're starting to see it in, in Vancouver. We saw it we saw it pretty pretty concretely this summer. And as you can imagine, changing this natural bound, the natural bound, of each of these variables will impact the biomass and therefore will impact the catchability and the distribution of exploited species, which therefore will impact the fisheries economy, which is the work of uh, uh, Vicky Lam. And given the fact that our politics and our management is from our, at the national level, except some case, some case study in the Pacific Islands or some agreement between some country, we saw that the shift of one species with the, with the example of Iceland, England, and Norway, with the species going to Iceland and, no, um, and um, Norway and England being like, that's our historical fishing, but can we fish in Island, Iceland, Iceland? And Iceland said, no, no, that's, that's my, my easy, you're not allowed. That creates a conflict that is, I think, has been resolved like two years ago, but it was a conflict of four years. So. This change of environment is cascading from a change of the ecosystem towards a change in our regulation. But what about biodiversity? We need to start by the, by the basic. The species distribution model and the incredible work of Christine Kaschner and Rainer Frost with Aquamap. They were the pioneer. They were the first one doing these kind of things in uh, 1998, I think that was the first, first models. It's a simple model. Basically, it's a trapeze. The idea is that you're taking the lower limit of each variable, the higher limit of each variable, which is technically the 99 percentile and the first percentile that give you your limits. Then you, you take um, 25 percentile, 75 percentile, and you put a linear regression. And anything between 25, the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile, it's flat. It's probability of one to find the species. So as you can imagine, as you can see, that create a trapeze. With, as, as you can imagine, some problems because it's a simplistic method. Whatever I can say, it's a simplistic method that's shown to be really good in the approximation of environmental fluctuation. Uh, the problem, of, uh, of course, of uh, the problem. The historical, since as you can imagine, the discipline have grown since the 2000, and now we have way more models. While um, for now, Aquam have got one SDM working with one Earth system models with one scenario, and of course, some little bias here and there because there is just no data or no uh, information on ecological traits for some species where they are to guess. And with the time now, we are getting better and better data, better and better observation, better and better. In, um, transfer of information towards uh, fish base and sea life base that, that are hosting all this information and trying to make it as open access as possible. And I promise to you, Daniel Poli didn't ask me to say that. Um, and you can use this data in order to refine with more fancy methodology and more, uh, more models to have a better and more robust distribution of species. And that's exactly what we have done. Uh, in, and that's what we are trying to push. So um, we, have tr we have tried to do that. So I, I tried to do it alone for the version one and two and a part of my version three of the output. And now we are version five and six to give you an idea that we, I started alone. Now we're starting to be four, five, six, seven to work on that. 
the idea is simple. It's basically the idea of account. Just you take all the data that we have. You try to clean the data so that was the first part of my tool. You try to gather all the ecological information on a species. Of course, you're not going to model a species that is living in deep sea with the surface of with the surface variables, and you try to use obviously uh, variables that are impacting the niche of the species and the niche of the species. Then basically you're trying to use different earth system model as input to take into account the variability between between the data uh, between the climate projection and the climate assumption in the the, the physical and the biochemical models and that's the most important thing so that's uh, that's here we, you you try to use a suite of of um, species distribution model in order to have a confidence interval in your projection and a metric saying, does my model is good enough to be published or not? Can, should I red flag it or is it okay? And more importantly, you, you do a model averaging, average and standard deviation that you can show on the website. That's what we are working on now um, with Christine, uh, with Christian Braden. And you got a final database once you got the distribution of the species. And I didn't go into the little detail where sometimes you can use specific habitat. If you know that the species is only in the reef, you're going to use the only the pixels that are reef to project the species, and which was not possible at, at uh, the beginning of Acoma because there was no raster of these habitats at that time. And you do a projection. So this is for famous. Uh, for famous uh, species such as Canadus fimarchicus, uh, for the for copepods, Canadus moria, uh, bluefin tuna, whales, uh, or, or jellyfish with um, um, for the Mediterranean Sea. And this allow you to uh, have an idea of the biodiversity patterns of species. So we started. So that was version three. With 7,000 uh, species of fish, we are now at 80,000 of, of fish. And in these 18,000 of fish, we can model 14,000 of them. Uh, and the mammals, same. All this number has been uh, updated. But the patterns remain the same because they are emergent patterns. And what you see here is basically a variation, exactly what I showed you in the data uh, previously, a variation in the Latino diversity gradient. But since it's modeled, and therefore you unbias the sampling bias that you have, except of course if you have <clears throat> a really important sampling bias in the data that are used to create your niche, that is obvious. That's why we have metrics to measure um, the quality of your models. Now you can also have new metrics such as rarity. It's always nice to see, um, to, to analyze biodiversity, but we rarely map rarity, which is technically the most important thing when we are doing conservation. It's nice to have a lot of species, no problem with that, but if there are cosmopolitan species that you can find everywhere, maybe it will be more interesting to protect areas where there is maybe a bit less species, but these species are only there. And you can analyze this pattern, of course, on land or in the ocean. And what you can see is what we expected is that you got a linear relationship between uh, species richness and rarity. The more and more species you have, the more rare and rare you're going to have due to this uh, competition speciation processes. And so you can use all these uh, index towards a new type of management. But as I was presenting two slides ago, there is climate change. And so all this distribution is going to change. And this is how climate change will impact biodiversity in the coming years. Uh, in red, so here, what you're saying is not the raw number. It's the percentage of change compared to a reference period of 1970-2000 with the SCP 2.6, which is um, Let's put it that way, close to the Paris Agreement, so a strong climate mitigation, and the FCP 8.5, which is recently crit criticized being too extreme. Um, but this is the business as usual, the worst case scenario, as you can, and as you can see here, uh, in in the best case scenario, we have some 
refuge uh, in the higher latitude where species gonna gonna get with basically just gonna track their niche and gonna you're gonna have a peak a, a change in biodiversity an increase of biodiversity in those sites uh, just because species are gonna shift there but uh, for the and obviously in a more climate change scenario these refuges are smaller and smaller but 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 this this forward shift using this methodology got some bias that are obvious first one the first one is do we have a perfect analysis of the extension of the niche using all the data that we have are we not truncating the niche and therefore underestimate <coughs> underestimating the environmental response of species just because we we have a truncated vision of the ocean second problem usually and also me one of my mistakes is that climate change as we all know will not change the light and basically the the the, the earth rotating around the sun and poles will be always poles meaning that there will be always six months of dark and six months of day Those species that will do a clear power migration toward the poles that all the species have the adapted the plasticity the adaptability to go there and stay there and sustain there or are we not overestimating the potential refuge that the pole can be and i think that's all for the climate change but i wanted to finish on on a, on a, a more positive note so even if we are using um climate projection we can also see what are the benefits of mitigating climate and you can see that there is 50 percent less turnover in species if we are adopting a COP21 up, a COP21 tra trajectory, we are also, as you saw in the previous slide, we are also allowing <coughs> more refuge, even in the temperate area, even in the tropical area, for species to survive. Again, the models are not in 3D. Maybe there is there is refuge in the deep, which most likely is. The second thing is we need to understand how much biodiversity is contributing to the blue economy. It's, uh, so there was a paper of Andres Cisneros that was published in Nature in uh, last year, where we show how much biodiversity was a key pillar in blue economy. And therefore, protecting biodiversity is protecting the blue economy. And maybe trying to explain that rather than just harvesting keystone species in the system will be interesting. And finally, a better conservation me uh, measures with the paper of Salah, obviously, and with the work of Derek Tinsor and Christina Bader uh, with the Global Fishing Watch uh, Initiative. The more and more marine protected area there will be, the more and more species we can have. And it, it's pretty surprising, but if there, with various papers and studies that I've seen and done, you see that you can protect pretty quickly 70 to 90% of the species and the ecosystem services associated by allocating new mine protected area in only 25 to 30% of the ocean and not the, the total ocean, which is nice because we're starting to see that we could do something. We could do something and we could protect the species that are in the ocean that represent the majority of the biomass of life in this planet where we are living. And that would be it for me. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>